we went down in the ravine. He kept going side healing along the road and in the ravine. And my understanding is he went on down farther and I could still hear the tank firing like it, the, the machine gun had jammed. I, I wasn't too sure what had happened. Then I could hear some explosions. And I was busy with my guys then also when we end up down in the ravine, I uh, remember landing on the radio man and uh, the radio man kept saying, Hernandez, get off me. And it was like slow motion and it was like I was in the echo room or something like this. So I was trying to crawl off of him and I, I remember it was like uh, slow motion and it was like uh, I was in a can or something, just the ringing or whatever. It was so, so bad that I couldn't hardly hear him. It's like when you're underwater and somebody's hollering at you. And uh, I remember finally getting off the radio man and for some reason I had six grenades in my side pouch. Usually you're only supposed to carry three grenades in those side pouches. I managed to turn them around just right and I had six grenades in my, my pouches. For whatever reason, I have a piece of metal or, that went into my leg on the side from when the charge hit the side of the track. That didn't set one of those grenades off is a miracle because we wouldn't be here talking about it. Nobody would have probably, none of the guys would have survived. But for some reason, uh, it didn't, and I had six grenades, and I don't know if the guy that was there with me had a weapon or not. I just give him, told him I had grenades, so I told him, get ready, because they were going to come down and finish us off. For a lot of years, I had nightmares that they were coming down to get us, and that I wouldn't be able to fend them off. But uh, my one friend there, I had a uh, battle dressing. I could feel something warm on my arm. I couldn't see it, so I didn't know that it was broken in two places. And then the blood was coming out at that time. That's what I could feel. I uh, had given him my grenades to set up, and then I asked him to help me with my flak jacket to get it off. I remember he helped me get it off, and I could feel a big hole in my back. So I knew I needed to have a uh, field uh, battle dressing on me, and I had one on my side, and I had him help me, and I don't know how we got it out of the pouch, but I had him help me uh, take it off, and he helped wrap it around, around me. And I can't believe I was still conscious at that time. Ask you, conscious through all this. They said that I must have been in and out, but I remember telling the radio man and I think this is what helped us get out of there. I had him let the uh, base know that we've been, we've been hit. This is let him know we've been hit. We will not have any kind of communications if they're coming out to get us. When they give up, get above the road, we'll key the mic twice, let them know that we're there. Because I didn't want to take a chance and that the enemy would hear us, come down there and finish us off. Like uh, Gary thought later that they were going to come down and finish them off too. So uh, basically that's what I remember. And then I remember, and I must have been in, in and out of consciousness, consciousness after that for a while because I remember them coming down the hill and it seems to me they stopped and picked up one of my other guys that was up closer to the road when we'd keyed the mic and let them know they were above us because we could hear them talking and we could hear the tank. I believe they sent one or two more tanks and a, a platoon or a company of guys walking with them uh, to come and get us. I uh, since been informed uh, of a corpsman that I actually talked to is back from back east. Uh, he actually worked on me at that time. Uh, one of the other guys with, with uh, Hotel, or I think it was Hotel 23, he came down and helped retrieve my body from down below. And, and this is the next morning now? It was at e that, that same was that time. Wow. I don't know how the time schedule is because it could have been, it seemed like a long time and when you're laying there and you're in and out and I, I thought, and it, somebody told me it could have been two hours, three hours, you know, right. to get us there back to uh, where the tanks were. 
I don't remember how long it was, but I remember when they came and got me down from down in that hole. They were going to put me on the tank, and I remember the tank was lurching or had some kind of problem that it didn't want to run really well. I didn't want to be put on that tank. Mm -hmm. You can imagine yes. after being blown off one, they're going to tell you you go back, <laughs> yeah. back on. I don't think so. <laughs> but I guess I must have been in and out at that time too because I, I remember them getting me to the top of the road and then I remember them putting me on, on the tank so on, the, on the back or on the front there and then uh, going down the road and I guess we went back to where the tankers had their base. Right. Uh, and the corpsman helping me out. Thank God I had a corpsman there that uh, helped. But, uh, and the guys were super coming down there and, and uh, retrieving uh, the rest of us out yeah. there. But we went to where the, the tanks were, and I don't remember where, Firebase something, and uh, I didn't even know the name of the base, but where the tanks were. Uh, I remember laying on the ground, and they actually called in the uh, double-bladed uh, Huey. 44s, I think is what it was, uh, at night. And that's kind of uncommon because you can get shot down yeah. come and bring a big chopper in at, at night. So, But I think they needed a bigger one to, to get us out of there rather than just a, a smaller one than uh, what we were used to as the, the Hueys. But uh, I remember laying there on the ground in the dust and the dirt flying around me and I just was looking straight up and uh, I was afraid to close my eyes because I thought if I closed my eyes, I was going to die. So I tried to stay too, but I probably passed out or was in and out of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the corpsman had probably given me a shot of morphine or whatever. And uh, I would remember there laying and looking up and I could see her, hear the chopper coming in. Then I saw for a short second before the chopper came down, he turned on his light to see how close he was to the ground. Once he saw how close, it, like, like he turned it on to see where he was, and it went out like that. And then, then I remember them putting me into the chopper. And I remember getting partially a, a, a ride. I remember the movement of us flying, and there was a gunner on the chopper. And I remember trying to grab him with my hand or a my right or my left hand, I can't remember. Finally, I got his attention. And he'd been sitting down on his hind uh, feet like you generally would, but one of them was my foot. And oh, I could please. feel it or it felt that he was hurt me. Yeah. And I got finally got his attention and he goes like this to me. And I remember that. Yeah. And then I remember going, I think it was to... Uh, Da Nang, or Da Nang, Dong Ha, Dong Ha, and that's where Graves Registration was, and that was where the uh, doctors were, I think it was Dong Ha. And when I got in there, I remember looking, and I thought it was all one time, and people asked me, because uh, I was declared uh, dead three times, they asked me, what's it like to be dead? Did you see the light? And I thought for a minute, well, maybe I did see a light, but then I always thought, maybe it's because so many people always say, well, you see a light, and then you see these movies where you see a light, but I gotta swear and tell you, it was more like a dream. You know how when you go to sleep and you dream and then you wake up? But I thought it was all one time. I didn't realize it was three different times that they declared me dead. Because at one time I do remember, I remember looking around the room and there were sandbags almost clear to the top of the, the roof inside. I remember them having silver uh, uh, surgical tables is what they were. I remember that and I remember somebody cutting, trying to cut my clothes off, cutting my boot off on my left leg, or my left foot, and my left leg cutting the trousers up the leg. And then I remember them reaching for my, uh, my chest, and I didn't know it at the time, but I had a collapsed lung. So uh, I remember them uh, doing that, and then I remember the doctor or whoever it was feeling between my ribs and sticking that tube mm -hmm. 
through there. They, I don't remember if they cut me there or not, but they stuck a tube, I guess, right into my lung area to uh, try and get the drain the liquid out of there and to uh, probably, I guess, do something with the lung, pump it up or whatever. But uh, I remember that, and then uh, I don't remember anything else except coming to, and uh, later they told me my friend Graves, which he calls, his name is Chuck Roth, he's from uh, uh, Philadelphia, Philly. He was working in the morgue, and he told me, he says, uh, Hernandez, I processed 2,700 bodies, and you're the only one that got away. And that was the only good thing that come out of Vietnam for me. Uh -huh. When you process that many uh, yeah. humans, you know, and he said we processed everybody. We processed gooks, dogs, children, everything. So to hear him tell me that, uh, I guess it's amazing. Uh, in 2010, I met him at the wall. It was a heck of a reunion. Uh, they've written uh, several stories about me. And uh, if you Google my name, Gil Hernandez did three times. You'll read his part of the story that he tells about how he found me in the morgue. And they were getting ready to fingerprint me at that time. He had a buddy there, and they worked on a buddy system. One took the right hand, one took the left hand, and they fingerprinted you. And then they would process the body, which they took a lot of pride and effort doing for the next of kin, you know. Being that they uh, would clean and uh, wash all the blood off and uh, make sure the body was presentable to the right. to the next of kin. So, did you ever find the corpsman? Uh, no, I didn't find the corpsman, but I did. I did talk to him. I haven't talked to him personally. I do have his phone number, yeah, okay. and he's he li lives back east. He actually works for the government. He works on air conditioning. I left him a message, and I. I, I I guess later he said, what are you talking about? Because I left him a message and let him know because I found he was a corpsman that worked on me. I says, I'm the uh, guy that uh, you say, but I did die three times. He says, <laughs> called me back, he says, I must have not done a very good job on you if you died three times. I says, well, if you hadn't done what you did, I would have probably yeah. been dead for sure. But uh, yeah. I thanked him uh, for what he did for me. Yeah. Uh, and he lives back, he, back east. And I do have his phone number. I called him and talked to him uh, one time only, and I, I don't know, with uh, us Vietnam vets, sometimes maybe that's enough just knowing yeah. or making contact that I l let him know. I haven't called him back since then, but uh, there's another group with Hotel 23 that uh, got me in line with, uh, with this corpsman and, and the other guy that came down and actually helped uh, get me out of the bottom of the ravine. So. Wow. But uh, that's our st story with Gary Hall and, and myself, and that's why I belong to the tankers, is because of Gary. Yeah. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here, but I would have never been in with tankers at all. I mean, I'm a 0311, I'm a grunt. Yep. I, I would rather take my chances in the jungle rather than riding on a tank. Yep. But everybody has their, uh, their choice, and uh, sometimes you don't have a choice, but uh, that's where I wanted to go. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you. We're yeah, glad you're here. Perfect. Well, that's basically what I remember, and this, this is what I wrote to Gary one time, and you can see it's almost exactly what I said. I might have left yeah. something out. No, but that's great. I was going to say, you look that's, like a singer or a movie star. That's just uh, before when I went to Vietnam. Can you get it? That is great. How old were you? I was uh, 18 then. I was 19 when I went to Vietnam. See, my birthday's in December, so. Okay. And then uh, I actually joined when uh, in '67 before I graduated. I wanted to go. Yeah, yeah. A lot of guys did. It, surprising, how many? Well, in fact, I, we were just talking about when the Marine Corps went to the draft. Uh, I already signed up, so yeah. I was on a delayed plan, and uh, I thought it was pretty bad. Yeah. I was not afraid of anything. I hope that doesn't go. That's great. Wow. And then I got another section I'll, I'll try to refer to. And okay. I actually wrote Gary that, that uh, you know, that I had there. So. Yeah. 
Well, if you have to refer to it or want to, just just. I just want to make sure I get it right, and I emailed Gary <coughs> some time ago. And there's another story about me that uh, I don't know if you're aware of, but he told you about. I died three times. Yes, that's. And there, if you Google my name up, uh, Gil Hernandez, uh, with one L, uh -huh. it'll the story will come up. And uh, there was quite a write-up. Uh, this came out of our own newspaper. It was a Dead Three Times Vietnam Veteran Tale of Survival. And then my friend that found me in grave registration, they uh, all also wrote a story about, uh, about it. He says, I'm no hero, I'm just a Marine. And they actually did a big story on it. We met at the wall in 2010 wow. for the first time after 40 some years. So. That's remarkable. But, uh, and then I got Gary's story here that he talked about the tank the tank story yep so you guys probably already have that but Gary it, you know him and I were kind of just tied together because of the Vietnam yeah. War but yep. tell us your name Gilbert Hernandez they, a lot of my friends call me Gil or I'm known by Gil too great um, you were in golf company yes two, three I was in golf I was a uh, in uh, third platoon I was a fire team leader. And what years were you in Vietnam? I was only, I was in uh, Vietnam in 1968. Okay. Uh, in 1968, I only uh, lasted four months, but four, t four months can be an eternity, uh, depending on where you're at. And uh, I have my MOS is 0311, which is a grunt. So uh, I was out in the, in the field uh, pretty much all the time. Where was your hometown back in the States when you... No. Uh, I grew up in uh, Montello, Nevada. Montello. Population of uh, about 113, maybe. That's counting all the dogs and cats, too. <laughs> so it wasn't a, a, a big uh, community. Yeah. You know. What we'd like to focus on, Gil, is we've got a, a, a tremendous story from Gary about his tank that uh, night and, uh, that you will remember also. And you were, as I understand it, you were part of the infantry squad or maybe half platoon riding on Gary's tank when the incident occurred. Can you kind of tell us where, how you got the, the lucky deal to get on the back of the tank and go out on that night ambush? Yes, I can. Uh, our uh, G23 also uh, went up and retrieved the uh, uh, bodies from 1-9. Uh, okay. 1-9 had uh, taken heavy casualties and uh, had left their dead, so uh, we, as a group, uh, Golf Company 2-3, we went up there as a group uh, to retrieve the bodies. And uh, we'd also been hit pretty hard by the, uh, the uh, Vietnamese Army, and so we, uh, because of the amount of uh, uh, men that we lost, it put us on bridge security at that time. Okay. So uh, my job, and it wasn't the one that I really wanted is uh, we had one of our guys that was the uh, M14 and it was an automatic weapon uh, that we had. And whenever you took the automatic weapon, I didn't realize it at that time, but uh, no one else wanted the M14 because the M14 was a, a little heavier than the M16. Mm -hmm. Even though I had seven magazines and I had double pouches, so I had 14 magazines total, I was an automatic weapon. Person, so uh, I became the fire team leader at that time because the automatic weapon person was the leader, and I didn't realize that, didn't know that at the time, but uh, that's what happened. And uh, because we took such heavy casualties, they put us on bridge security, and that was probably at the start of the uh, what they had called Pegasus, and Pegasus was going to be uh, a operation where they would open the highway, back up from uh, the pontoon bridge, what we call pontoon bridge, uh, back to Quezon uh, to make sure that the soldiers would get, uh, soldiers and Marines would get uh, ammunition and uh, supplies that we needed. I didn't know it at that time, but uh, I was at a bridge security there. I met Gary Hall at that time. Uh, he was a tank commander. Uh, we were dug in around his his tank. We had some uh, foxholes that we had dug out, and uh, that evening, uh, I met Gary, and uh, 
we were all kind of sitting around talking, and I didn't know it at the time, but uh, the uh, enemy had fired uh, three rockets in on top of us, and it was about dark. And uh, Gary had a, which was kind of funny part of this story, is Gary had a uh, coffee pot. He had one of them little silver coffee pots that I guess he used to make coffee or tea or whatever he drank at the time. But he had it on top of the uh, track in that area, and uh, or the fender, and they hit us with three mortars. And uh, we all got in our holes in that. And after everything was o well over, uh, Gary's tank fired into the hillside. He fired two or three rounds up in the hillside where he thought the uh, enemy uh, rockets were coming from. And that silenced him down, but afterwards he got out of the tank and we, we all was talking, you know, that uh, it was close but not that close, you know. But it, evidently it was because his coffee uh, uh, percolator that he had there, one of them little metal ones, had uh, been hit and it had a big uh, hole in the side of it and uh, it was... Uh, then uh, so far useless. <laughs> so that's kind of something that was kind of funny at the time. But uh, you know, if you can uh, have something that's kind of a, a funny situation when when you're in a combat area, and there's other times when uh, there were some things that uh, probably happened that were kind of funny, but at the same time it was uh, sad or serious. Sure. Yeah. But uh, that evening. A little bit later, he came to me, and it was about a 10 o'clock at night. I know it was dark. I held my hand out in front of me, and I couldn't even see my hand. That's how dark it was. So there was not a moon. He said, Hernandez, we're going down the road. We're going up and bring the convoy back. And I, my understanding was from the pontoon bridge that was down a ways. I said, I really don't want to go. I have a bad feeling about this because they'd already tried to hit us mm -hmm. and we were going to be on a road where a tank makes noise and like p people say you either like tanks or you don't like tanks and uh, I didn't want to be on a tank because they were noisy and not only that they had a light in front of them and we were going to be going down a designated road where the enemy knew that road and uh, I had been so used to being in the hills in the DMZ uh, seek and destroy type missions that uh, to be confined on a tank that was not my idea of, of uh, fighting the war at that time. Uh, so we got orders to go ahead and get ready and uh, we got on top the tank that evening and uh, we proceeded to go down the road. I don't remember how far it was, how many clicks it was or you know in miles. It just seemed like we'd gone down oh just a, a ways. And then we came to this place where uh, uh, it is called the switchback, mm -hmm. yeah, right in that area. And it's an area that I wasn't really familiar with, but uh, Gary had been familiar with because he's, he's a tanker, he's been on that road. I've never really been on that road except to come up and uh, uh, before I got there and, and get up to Quezon. But, uh, it's an area where it switches back and forth, and you actually come back around and you can see the other side. It's such a, a switchback. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's along the river and then along the mountains there. And the enemy have a uh, better uh, place because they can overlook you down below or in certain areas. And uh, I happen to have all my guys on top of the tank towards the back, we were all riding on the back. How many? It seems to me I had like seven or eight, I can't really remember. I had a fire team, and plus I had a radio man, which I usually, you know, you don't have a radio man unless yeah. you're going out, but I had a radio man with me. And uh, my foot was hanging over the back, uh, clear to the back, where the uh, engine is. And I had one foot dangling down and I had the other one propped up a little, little bit and I had my uh, rifle at that time, the M14, uh, the fully, on, fully automatic. We were going down the road and the next thing I know, I hear a blast and it's behind the tank. So they had missed the tank at that time and that blast hit my legs and uh, I had shrapnel in my legs and uh, I lost a uh, toe because of that and uh, another toe that was uh, uh, attached uh, 
made uh, smaller. Mm -hmm. So I'd already been wounded and at the same time I swung my rifle around and just fired a magazine uh, automatic up to one side. I don't know if we hit anything and then uh, the tank started firing at the same time. But just about the same time as that explosion was behind us, one hit right alongside on the track itself. We were going, uh, so if the bank side was on my right hand side as we're going down, it hit the track on the left hand side. That explosion took my rifle right out of my hand. I had a uh, scuba diving watch. It blew that off my hand. I didn't know that till later. It blew it clear off my wrist. That blast sent my rifle into the air or wherever. And uh, it broke, later on I found it broke the ulna in two places. I didn't even know I'd broken my arm. I uh, couldn't do anything, but it seemed like I could hear the tank firing, the machine gun, and I could hear the blast coming from the uh, side uh, charges that they have. Mm -hmm. But it, and almost within a few seconds of that, and I think that's where Gary's tank driver was killed, a blast came from the front. That blast, uh, whether it was upon top or towards the front, hit me in the in the back. I had a flak jacket on, which probably saved my life. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I got hit three times by all three charges that they had, uh, the first charge missing the tank, the two other two charges hit the tank, so I was hit by three different charges. And they said later on that we would be hit by rockets, satchel charges, and mortars. Uh, so I don't know how much of that is true, but that's what I was told. Mm -hmm. And uh, about the same time, when you take the track off on one side, the tank is going to steer to the other side. So what happened is we were going down the road, and the right side is okay, but it's pulling more because there's no traction on the left-hand side. It swings up or down towards the, the ravine of the canyon, and it, it, this all happened within a matter of uh, minutes mm -hmm. or whatever. But when it did that, my guys and all of us, and I don't even remember if they got any rounds off or what was going on because I was busy with what was happening to me. Right. It, when it tipped to go down the ravine, it made us all fall off, or most of us, as far as I know, fall off. Mm 